The glittering metropolis of Abu Dhabi, capital of the United Arab Emirates and home to the 30-second running of the legendary Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge, round two of the W2RC World Championship. Pre-event checks gave the competitors a chance to catch up for the first time since January's Dakar. Sam Sunderland and Kevin Benavides will miss this year's event because of injury, but the bikes will be as close as ever. Lining up for Honda, Quintanilla, Brabeck, Corneo and Van Beveren. While Toby Price leads the KTM charge alongside young hotshot Mason Klein. On the Hero Machines, Botswana's Ross Branch with Sebastian Buhler. Fresh off the back of a commanding victory on the Dakar is Nasser Alatia hunting his fourth Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge win. Dakar runner-up Sebastian Loeb returned to Abu Dhabi eager to go one better. And Saudi Arabia's Yazid Al Raji on top form could not be overlooked either. The T3 class promised to be super tight with Dakar winner Austin Jones up against teammates Seth Quintero and Mitch Guthrie in the Red Bull Off-Road Junior Team. The pre-event press conference as ever provided a great opportunity for everyone to share valuable insight into what could be expected from the event, a chance for media and rivals to hear from the expected front runners. The event kicked off with the traditional short prologue stage, a full sand affair, just 6.7 kilometers to determine the starting order for the first main stage. Picking up where he left off on the Dakar, Nasser Alatir was four seconds quicker than anyone. Five long days and nearly 2,000 kilometers lay ahead for the drivers and riders, taking them into some of the most remote desert expanses on the planet. part of my life, you know, being the founder of the Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge when the challenges were there. It means a lot to me because, you know, to see something that I invested 30 years of my life, over 30 in it, where it went up and down and the challenges were there and to see it is very, I'm attached to it also. It's about also the championship that I'm pushing with the team to make sure it grows. We cannot only have the birth we have to take care of this baby newborn. Never underestimate the dunes of Abu Dhabi and the UAE. This part of the world is very demanding. It's demanding on the cars, on the, both the driver and the co-driver, and also in the organizers. So I would say well done to them. I'm always here with an open mind. Um, I am from the desert, I understand it, it's beautiful and I wish them a very safe event. The Rulers' representative court Al Dafa region stage one promised 242 kilometers of flat out racing through Abu Dhabi's biggest dunes. Stunning Desert Sunrise greeted the riders as they gathered at the stage start, eager to get away. Ross Branch finished stage one in third. The happy-go-lucky Botswana rider on the hero machine just keeps getting better and better. A Dakar stage winner, could he do the same in Abu Dhabi? Longtime beach racer turned desert dune specialist Adjen van Beveren is at home in the sand and a real contender for victory. A great opening ride on the Honda CRF 450, van Beveren's second fastest. But out front, repeating his prologue performance, Pablo Quintanilla, topping the timesheets in the stage to lead the bikes overall. His strategy to choose 11th starting position worked perfectly. Everything played into the Chilean rider's hands. He led for Honda and even had enough time for some showboating. 
we did a, a good stage uh, for our team. Uh, the bike felt really good. Uh, the dudes really strong, and yeah. when you have a when you, you feel good on the bike, the whole confidence, confidence is coming and also to the rhythm and the, the speed. So I think it's a mix of everything, and uh, yeah, it was a good day, but it's just uh, stage number one. With the prologue coefficient rule taken into account, Toby Price jumped up to third behind Van Beveren and Quintanilla. History must have seemed like it was repeating itself in Abu Dhabi for Sebastian Loeb. The start of a 3,000 kilometer rally and we've only done 30. As the BRX Hunter ground to a halt with overheating issues, the nine-time World Rally champion and co-driver Fabian Lequin were forced to stop for repairs. We'll do the best we can. We started today as points leaders, so we'll try and hang on to that, but we'll see at the end. It's not great mentally, not good motivation, but here we are. We'll see how much we've lost. We've repaired it, so we'll see how long it lasts. The duo forged on. But their day would finish on the end of a tow rope as they were recovered to the bivouac for the engineers to assess the situation. In the early going, Loeb's teammate Gerlain Chicheret enjoyed a tight battle with defending champion Nasser al -Atiyah. But then he also stopped struggling with chronic motion sickness, possibly a legacy of his big Dakar crash just over a month ago. It's hell. Uh, I felt more or less okay, but I know it's not going well. And then it hits me, bam. I can't see the top of the dunes. I'm very, very disappointed. It's very frustrating. Bad day for ProDrive, it was a very good day for Toyota. Three time Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge winner Nasa Alatia started by chasing his rivals through the stage. And there was no repeat for him of last year's first stage dramas. He raced away to win the opening stage by over six minutes. Tunes were also kind to Yazid Al Raji. The Saudi claimed a fine third on the Dakar and was fourth on the prologue, only 11 seconds behind four time winner Al Atiyah. At the end of day one in the Dunes, he lay second overall. A six minute lead for Al Atiyah, with Al Raji only 13 seconds ahead of third placed Henk Lettigan in an all Toyota top three picking up five bonus points for winning the stage, the Qatari would take over the provisional lead of the W2RC. California's Seth Quintero looked unstoppable in T3, still looking for his first world championship win. Alongside co-driver Dennis Sense, the pair started their bid well, topping the timesheets to lead overall going into day two. The Dunes have a love-hate relationship. I love them, or I hate them, to be honest, because it gets hot, slow, treacherous, but for some reason we always seem to do well on them, and that's exactly what we did today. Uh, looks like we're probably like sixth overall in top car, so super stoked on that. Good way to start the rally. Hopefully we can uh, continue this and, and have a good time for the rest of the week. Quintero's teammate Austin Jones also had a strong day in the Dunes. Seven minutes sounds like a big lead, but in the desert, that can evaporate in an instant. Quintero led after day one in T3 with Jones in hot pursuit. The battle lines were drawn. And this is how things stacked up in the W2RC Championship. Could Jones reel in Quintero? Day one was a disaster for Cristina Gutierrez. She had to be rescued after running out of fuel. Gutierrez was not alone. Running out of fuel in the desert inevitably costs a huge amount of time, as Alex McInnes also discovered. 
around kilometer 150 and my bike cut out and I ran out of fuel which uh, was unfortunate and I was sitting there for two hours waiting for fuel. Yeah, the bike is uh, a lot more heavy when we have uh, both tanks full. There's five liters in the back and uh, 17 in the front. So when both are full, it's a bit heavier, but the main thing is we're on enduro bikes compared to the big rally bikes. This holds less fuel. So we sort of have to manage our fuel a bit more. Are we ready for, for a certain amount and a certain distance? But um, yeah, it's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> My rosy telling that no, I, you know, I manage. Uh... In the desert, you can't just pull into a fuel station, so official fuel supplier Adnock Distribution brings the gas station to the competitors. When it comes to fuel, we don't take risks. We go with a full tank. In the sand, we use a lot of fuel. Because we have to manage the navigation, it's important to leave a little margin for error too. As well as that, it's cool to see where we are at refueling. It helps us to work out where we are in the race. Uh, yeah, I don't know uh, if Ross and I are the, the, str the strategist. We don't really we don't really know what's going on. We're trying to figure it out right now, but. Um, yeah, quick math we're not good at. We're gonna need a calculator, so. Without Adnock Distribution's fuel, the entire event would grind to a halt. Spain's Pau Navarro was third in T4, just over a minute behind second, and he was the second best place W2RC driver, so everything to fight for. Local heroes Mansour El Hale and Mohamed Al Hamri had a strong day on home sand. Four minutes and 15 off the lead. With four more long, hot days of action to go, that margin could vanish in a moment. The overnight leader is not new to being the hunted, however. Lithuania's Rokas Bruchaska was the 12th starter right after the best of the T1 cars and managed to open up a slender advantage during a day which was every bit as challenging as it had promised to be. Uh, it was a tough day, you know. It was hot, 38 degrees. Uh, my driver was sickness. Uh, he a little bit blue, you know, in the front of the stomach. But we survived, you know. First day, the organization said it will be difficult, hot. And yeah, it is like that. Uh, tomorrow, another day, and uh, we will see how it's going on. The favorite for victory was living up to his pre-event billing, but with four long, hot days ahead, nothing was set. And with W2RC championship points at stake, the pressure was on. Stage two presented by Adnock Distribution and a short road section before the stage starts with 257 competitive kilometers before reaching the finish line. Another early start for the riders in the W2RC and a long day of competition ahead. Skyler House on the Husqvarna made good use of his strong start position and ran the majority of the stage in second place. The American finished one minute and 44 seconds off the pace to eventually finish third, but his day's work was not yet done. Today I definitely got Pretty warm out there. It was really hot and uh, really physically demanding. Um, it's a marathon stage, so we got to take care of the bike and got a little bit of work to do today. So <clears throat> hopefully we can get that checked off and uh, be ready for tomorrow. The fastest of the Honda factory riders on day two was Jose Ignacio Corneo Florimo on the CRF 450. The Chilean second quickest in what was a smooth run through the desert to lie fourth overall. The convincing winner of the stage on his Husqvarna was Luciana Benavides. He arrived at the first checkpoint fourth fastest, but by kilometre 76 had taken the lead by two seconds and went on to extend that to over a minute by the finish line. The Argentine moved up to third in the overall standings. The last week, 
been really, really tough for me with the, yeah, the accident of my brother and also was many ups and downs. So finally to, to get a stage win and get the confidence back is something really nice. Tomorrow is a, another tough day. I had to open, so yeah, it's going to be a, a hard challenge, but I'm ready, I'm ready to do it. Two stages in and things already changing in the bikes on a daily basis. An added challenge after the day's stage was the marathon aspect. And that means only a limited time to work on the machine and only the rider can do so. Fastest of the quads through stage two, Lithuania's Lavistus Cancius. After problems on day one, he rode flat out to drag himself back into contention and move up to second overall. After two stages, local hero Abdulaziz Ali remained on course to make it three Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge wins in a row. South African Henk Lettigen lay second overnight, but was forced out of the dunes with a misfire. We started the stage off OK, everything was going well, and uh, shortly after that uh, we started getting a misfire. And uh, unfortunately we couldn't fix the problem, so um, we came out the stage and uh, back to the bivouac to save the engine for tomorrow. So the mechanics and engineers will work uh, today and tonight to, to see if we can get it back up and running and carry on for tomorrow. Points are available for winning each of the stages as well as for overall victory. Nasser Alatia was chasing them all and claimed victory on stage two by almost eight minutes. The Toyota once more proved as fast and bulletproof as it had on the Dakar. Yeah, it's a very difficult stage and uh, not easy. We have two times uh, big impact, you know, and uh, it's a little bit uh, shoulder is not uh, really 100%, but OK. We finish and uh, we are quite happy. Saudi Arabia's Yazid Al Raji finished stage one in a fantastic second position overall. His pace on the Dakar had hinted at such potential. Now he was delivering. But in the technical dunes of Abu Dhabi, it's all too easy to give time away if you're too cautious or too eager. Al Raji paced himself perfectly, opening up the gap on his pursuers. Almost the first thing Martin Prokop saw on stage two was a struggling Toyota. From very early on, he'd have known he was potentially up to third overall. A little under four minutes behind second place Al Raji's Toyota overnight, the Ford driver lost a further two minutes and 41 seconds, but after two days in the desert, would go to bed happy and on the podium in third overall. With two wins on two stages, Nasser Alatia continued to lead as his rivals hit trouble. W2RC contender Martin Prokop had a strong day, moving up to third. Good progress from the Czech driver. The co-driver's role in rally raids is greatly misunderstood. Sebastian Loeb and Fabien Lequin give us the lowdown. Co-driver's role in Rally Raid is hyper important. I think it's 50% of the job. Our job is to avoid mistakes. We're not always in the spotlight, but here, where the cars and drivers are so equal, the co-driver can make the difference. In Rally Raid, there's also navigation with waypoints, tracks to find, so the co-driver's role is hyper-important. No matter how fast you go, with bad direction, it's nothing. If the driver slows down too much in a valley, you've lost a few seconds. You have to keep in mind the principle is to keep the car on four wheels rather than going fast. With the driver, you create a code, otherwise it's too repetitive for him. I need to give him the details he needs to win the race. 
We both have the same way of approaching the navigation. We both know a little bit about it, and we're always working to optimize our system, and it's starting to go well. Sweden's Matthias Ekström, who drove for Audi on the Dakar, won T3 on stage three, having run out of fuel the previous day. Otherwise, he'd have been right in the class fight. We had to take care about the car for the temperature, and uh, except for this, we had a clean day, no big issues, and uh, yeah, just happy to have a nice day. Ekstrom showing great speed, but nowhere near the front of the pack in T3. And for our W2RC competitors, the points all still up for grabs. Spain's Pau Navarro lay third after the first day, and despite finishing third again, because of a penalty for Mansour Al Hale, he leapfrogged the Emirati to go second. Rokas Buchaska retains the T4 lead despite losing time on stage two. Co driver Aurel Vidal Montigano had been sick the previous day but more than made up for it when their can -Am buggy struck trouble. I got one stuck in the dunes, but we gained faster, you know, we uh, the driver get out and uh, push the buggy and we go uh, again. Taking no chances, they accepted a tow back to the bivouac. Local heroes Mansour El Hale and Mohamed El Hamri had a strong day one and were fastest on day two, which would have given them the lead had they not picked up a 15-minute penalty for missing a waypoint, dropping them from second to third. With a little over four minutes in his pocket, there could still be no relaxing for the leader. The penalty for the Abu Dhabi duo showed that. Abu Dhabi 360, stage three, the rally's midpoint. 266 competitive kilometers, an almost 50-50 mix of dunes and sandy tracks. The start of the stage lay just two kilometers from the bivouac, meaning no antisocial wake-up calls. Instead, a lazy walk to Parc Ferme to collect their bikes from where they left them overnight, having serviced them themselves as per the marathon stage rules. It was a tense start to the day for America's Skylar House. He'd repaired a leaking rear fuel tank the previous night in service, and it would only be in the stage that he'd find out whether that temporary seal would hold or not. It held. House went third fastest. Prologue and stage one winner Pablo Quintanilla made good use of a later start position to dominate, looking set to retake the overall lead until he picked up a two minute penalty for speeding, which means he lay second overall, just 43 seconds behind teammate Edgen van Beveren. Toby Price had ridden smart on the KTM finishing fifth and sixth on the first two days, ensuring a safe start position without sacrificing too much time in the overall fight. But after Quintanilla's penalty, Price was promoted to stage winner, meaning he'd open the next day and he'd need to nail it to reel in the Hondas in front. Just 43 seconds between the Hondas of Van Beveren and Quintanilla. And what could Toby Price do over the last two days? Local hero Abdulaziz Ali was hoping for his third Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge win in a row. And so far, everything was going according to plan. The Emirati took another stage victory on day three to extend his overall advantage. With only two stages remaining, the Emirati was edging ever closer to his hat-trick of wins.
day three. Disaster for rally leader Nasser al -Atiyah. With victory on the first two stages, Nasser al had asserted himself at the top of the leaderboard. The Qatari sped through day three, fastest at each control point, seemingly without dramas. But when he arrived at the finish, it was clear he'd had a major accident. It had been just 10 kilometers from the end. The car was wrecked. The Toyota's safety cell has done its job. NASA and co-driver Mathieu Baumel were fine, but the team will have to work very hard to be ready for the next event, Mexico's Sonoma Rally at the end of April. It was really a fast section, no danger, nothing, but uh, suddenly we find a small step from the sand, you know, from the wind and it was in sixth gear and just we we crash three four times and we land in the wheel and nothing left in the cars everything destroyed but we try to to manage and to finish the stage and we finish the FIA decide you know to not continue because I think something damaged you know in the roll cage Martin Prokop now found himself a fraction over 10 minutes off the lead with two days still to go. Always within a couple of minutes of Alatia, Sebastian Loeb finished the stage just 48 seconds adrift. But as his Qatari rival had retired, he took the bonus points for the stage win. And with Alatia now guaranteed to score nothing in Abu Dhabi, the pressure was on low to perform and to finish. South African Henk Lattigan was on the attack. Unable to match the pace of the two leaders, he was enjoying a tight battle for third fastest with fellow Toyota driver Yazid Al Raji, where the gap was rarely more than a minute and often much less. It's all changed again in T1, with the big names all hitting problems. Two days remain for someone to snatch an unlikely victory. An event that seemed certain to rob Sebastian Loeb of the W2RC championship lead was now swinging back in the Frenchman's favor. Mitch Guthrie, no longer in the fight for overall honours after day one dramas, was now looking good to pick up points for stage wins. And he did just that, quickest in T3. Still in the lead of the class at the midway point was Seth Quintero. The American hadn't been on the top step of the podium since Rally du Maroc last year. But that all looked likely to change in Abu Dhabi. Today was an awesome day, actually. We uh, did a phenomenal job. Dennis did a great job. I, I think we extended our overall lead to close to 30 minutes today. So awesome day today for the overall. Uh, Sandy, as always, my eyes hurt. Uh, Love-hate relationship with the Dunes, for sure. So Quintero continued to lead over 27 minutes clear of Austin Jones in second place. And for those entered in the full Rally Raid World Championship, this is how it all looked with two days to go. Day three in the Dunes and Spain's Pau Navarro was once again third at the finish line, but now only 17 seconds ahead of his Emirati rival. Buoyed by his day two victory, local hero Mansour al Hale kept attacking, swapping seconds with world champion Rokas Puchaska in pursuit of another stage win. For two days, Puchaska has used three words to sum up his stages. It was hot. The Lithuanian was just one second behind at the final passage control. The 30 kilometer sprint to the finish would clinch the win for him. It was indeed hot. There was quite nice road. There was some straight, some dunes. So it was really fun to drive. I am confident, you know, that you never know. Sometimes you can do mistake, you know, you cannot see the drop and something and you can broke the buggy. 
The battle for the podium in T4 continued to rage, with changes possible at any moment. And there was still plenty at stake for the W2RC contenders, and 500 more kilometres of punishing dunes lay ahead. For me, the passion of being in a machine is uh, very big. I love being in uh, cars. I am Mansour Al Hili. I'm the driver for uh, Team Abu Dhabi 360 in uh, Canam T4. I'm happy to compete with people who uh, come from many events like Dakar, Hayel, and many international events. For me, uh, racing against them shows my potential. Honest, straightforward dancer, I grew up in this environment. My father used to race nearly 40 years ago. And every father loves teaching his skills to his uh, children. So I've been taught by him and uh, for me, he's uh, the best. I can start from personal life, I can start from racing. Till this day, he will keep on giving me uh, tricks and techniques in the sand, even today. He will always keep on giving me those uh, tricks. Behind the wheel, it's, it's a different feeling. Behind the wheel, uh, you're thinking of the specific stage you're in you're not worried about anything else you're you you're in your mode of racing my goal and uh, vision is very simple i would love to win a world championship i know i am capable of it uh, i know i will uh, make it one day it's not only representing me or my family at the end of the day it's representing uh, your country. That flag on the car, I want to lift it high and have my national anthem on every event I go in. Unusually foggy conditions greeted the competitors before stage four. Officials were forced to delay the start on safety and sporting grounds. Uh, they can't ride in the, in the fog, uh, and if they can ride in the fog, in the, if the visibility is enough, the helicopters need to be able to land for safety purposes, so we have to have clearance basically from the riders and from the helicopters. The fog eventually lifted, and when it did, the fun and games could begin. <laughs> Stage 4, presented by AlphaTone Motors Toyota. 308 kilometres of race action for the bikes, but as a result of the late start, the cars would only complete 173. Opening the stage was day three winner Toby Price and despite the Australian's experience, first into the sand is always the hardest task of all. Lying third overall, Price had to nail his navigation but he was soon caught by Pablo Quintanilla and not long after that, Skylar Howes joined the party. Inevitably, Price lost time. The question was how much? He crossed the finish line and it wasn't good news. He dropped nearly nine minutes from third to sixth overall. But this is where Pablo Quintanilla's rally ended, stranded in the desert dunes. It's a rare sight, but his Honda CRF 450 had cried enough, and the Chilean's fight for the overall win was over. The overall leader was Edgen van Beveren. His performance on day four would be critical as to decide whether or not he would take his first Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge win. I tried a different strategy for this race, but you know, it's always difficult to know where you're going to be. I think I, I've been on the better side than at the Dakar, 
and uh, it's, it looks like it's going well, but still one day to go and we will keep really focused. Luciano Benavides on the Husqvarna, riding fast and smart, won the stage by over three minutes. To position himself comfortably in second overall, challenging for victory with one day to go. Van Beveren remained the leader from Benavides, with Corneo holding a slim 24-second advantage over Branch in the fight for third. The dark cloud that descended over Sebastian Loeb after just 30 kilometers of the Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge did have a silver lining. The W2RC Championship leader's closest rival, Nasser al Atiyah, had retired on day three after a sixth gear crash, meaning he'd score nothing, while the Frenchman picked up five bonus points as the winner of the stage. With another win on day four, Loeb had already pocketed 10 bonus points with five more possible, but he had to reach the finish line to claim them. So he and his co-driver continued mixing speed with caution, avoiding all the hazards the desert could throw at them. If finishing the rally was vital for Sebastian Loeb, it was doubly so for Yazid al Raji. The Saudi and German co-driver Timo Gottschalk held a near nine minute lead overnight with the prospect of a massive win just two days away. But there was a lot more than just glory at stake. Even without a stage win, Victory would catapult Al Raji to joint third in the W2RC title race. The stakes were extremely high. And overall, we are lead in the stage. We don't need to to fight with the stage and take a mistake and lose everything. Now I have again motivation after this race. We can go Argentina, Mexico, Morocco. Before my plan, uh, Argentina, not sure. Now, sure, I go. Abu Dhabi was turning into quite a remarkable rally for Martin Prokop. When you start an event with two cars from Toyota Gazoo Racing and two from BRX Pro Drive in the field, you largely assume you might be battling for a spot in the top six at best. Lying second after three days, Prokop chased the leader through the shortened stage, losing less than a minute to Al Hadri's Toyota while strengthening his hold on second. While the gaps on the podium will be tough to close, the battle for fourth is a close one with 200 kilometers left in which to decide it. If Sebastian Loeb finishes, he'll have established a big lead over Nasser al without having won an event. In the T3 prototype class, Matthias Engström, who retired again on day three, was back at it once more. The Swede had nothing to lose, and alongside co-driver Emil Bergqvist, blasted through the dunes to go quickest of the T3s and unbelievably second quickest across all the car categories. Only Sebastian Loeb was quicker. Overall leader Seth Quintero was also dicing with the T1 cars. He really didn't need to push, but still went second fastest, and with just one stage remaining, led the class by over 28 minutes. Uh, stage for us today was great. I mean, today we did what we could to, to stay safe and, and you know try to get another top five, hopefully to grab some more points, but today was a day to uh, manage for sure. Victory was looking like a foregone conclusion for Quintero, but if disaster struck, Austin Jones was there to pick up the pieces. So he was taking no risks, over three and a half minutes down, but comfortably in second overall. Quintero, fast and reliable, leading from teammate Jones, all to play for behind. And this is how things stand in the W2RC. A win at Dakar and second here would be a great result for Austin Jones.
Third on each of the first three stages, young Spaniard Pau Navarro lay second overall. But on the shortened stage four, there was nothing he could do to hold off local hero Mansour El Hale. I really enjoyed was this last section with dunes. The only interesting part because the other stage was all straight with Summit. T4 world champion Rokas Puchaska was striking a balance between speed and caution. He could afford to spare a few seconds in the dunes, and even if he lost time at the same rate on the final day, the maths certainly favoured the Red Bull driver. Safe stage, you know, to don't broke the car and just to see how it's going on. Tomorrow is the last day, uh, and I think uh, we are in good gap, and uh, yeah, tomorrow we will see how it will be. The target for UAE duo Mansour El Hale and Mohamed Al Hamri was to stand proudly on the top step of the podium with their national anthem playing. They were third fastest overall on the shortened stage, taking three and a half minutes out of the T4 leader. And the Emirates driver reckoned it could have been better still. I was disappointed when they said to me today the stage will be cut in half. The longer the better I can reduce my gap. It was fun. We reached the finish line. This is the uh, ultimate goal. Local hero Mansul Al Hale trailed leader Rokas Puchaska by 14 minutes and 15 seconds, a 15 minute penalty for a missed waypoint, denying him the lead. And with Puchaska still the favourite for maximum points, he was looking set to race away from his W2RC rivals. The 371-kilometre Abu Dhabi aviation stage would bring the competitors back to Abu Dhabi City and to the end of the 2023 Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge. Skvarna rider Luciano Benavides was first into the stage and riding to hang on to his second place overall, which meant not making any navigational errors. Of course, he would lose time, but could he limit the damage? Using all his experience, he posted the seventh fastest time, but with bonus points awarded, it was enough to confirm second place overall. Australia's Toby Price simply flew. He came into the final stage down in sixth overall, but he was blowing everybody else out of the water. And as he cleared the final waypoint, a podium finish was on, but it would be close. Incredibly, he had done just enough to steal third. The races are quite close and um, yeah, we're, we're happy. So it's a good championship point, but uh, yeah, it would be nice to be a little bit further up, but. All in all, uh, it's been a good rally. On his factory Honda, Adrian van Beveren was the most consistent rider, finishing every single stage inside the top five. He nailed his navigation at every turn and simply made no mistakes. Add all of that together and you have the recipe to win at this level. The overall winner in the bikes, Adrian van Beveren. It's crazy, you are riding alone all day, pushing as hell risking your life, giving all, and it's nice to get a win. Another win with the Honda, and I feel really happy with the team. Confirmation of Van Beveren's victory, his final winning margin over four minutes, back to Benavides with Price in th And for those riders entered in W2RC, here are the final standings in the Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge. French youngster Jean-Luc Lepin came into the final day leading the Rally 2 category, but third in the stage was not enough to hang on. Nevertheless, he ended this week a very creditable second. The winner was Austrian hotshot Tobias Ebster. 
Heinz Kindergartner's young nephew claimed the Rally 2 victory at his first time of trying in Abu Dhabi. Mansour Al Hale and co driver Mohamed Al Hamri always faced a tough task trying to overhaul the rally leader. But the Emirati duo were justifiably bursting with pride, second on their home event. And barring that 15 minute penalty from missing waypoints, they could well have secured a fantastic T4 win. I'm really proud of that. Yesterday I finished uh, behind the top cars. Yes, we had a mistake with the waypoint. Uh, but I'm happy with my navigator and being second with the penalty, reducing the gap, that's amazing. Three stage wins and victory in T4. It had been a great event for reigning world champion Rokas Buchaska. It wasn't all plain sailing, but he matched his Emirati rivals blow for blow to claim a well-judged victory. It was a tough rally. Uh, the target is to defend the champion because last year I was champion. And I hope we can fight and we can take the points and we will see you in Mexico. Always one of the favourites for the Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge, Rokas Buchaska certainly delivered. Mitch Guthrie's 11th place finish doesn't reflect his pace in Abu Dhabi. The American notched up two stage wins and there's no question he would have been right in the fight for overall honours had he not run into trouble on day one. W2RC Championship leader and double Dakar winner Austin Jones played second fiddle to teammate Seth Quintero all week. He was happy enough to take the runner-up spot and the championship points because he knows there is more pace there when he needs it. On the top step of the podium for the first time since Rally du Maroc last year, 21-year-old Seth Quintero. Drawing on the experienced Dennis Sense alongside him, and of course his natural raw pace, proved to be the winning formula. Quintero claimed a first Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge victory. You know, this ride was absolutely amazing. Had a lot of fun all week. Stoked to come away with the overall win. Looks like we ended up getting third overall car as well, which is absolutely amazing. Great week for the points in the championship. Took over the overall lead. Got the win, got a couple stage wins, so really couldn't have asked for a better week. A well-deserved victory for Quintero, nearly 28 minutes clear of Austin Jones, with Hernan Garces Echeviera closing out the podium spots. And victory for Quintero in Abu Dhabi means he now leads T3 in the World Championships. Two entirely different battles again raged on the final stage of the Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge. The battle for the stage win and the battle for overall victory. Sebastian Loeb went head to head with Henk Lettigen. The Frenchman trying to claim five bonus points. The South African equally determined to finish with his first stage win. In the end, the Toyota driver managed to eke out a slender advantage over his rival. Just two minutes and two seconds. A few points for the championship, but that was important. Uh, Nasser gave us a, a present uh, with this mistake, so we are still uh, in the lead of the championship. So After a week knocking on the door of the top six, the final day saw Sebastian Halpen posting the third fastest time as he raced to fourth in T1. The best mini at the finish, a minute and a half off the class podium. 
After two days of ups and downs, Argentina's Juan Cruz Jacopini was looking likely to finish fourth until mini driver Denis Krotov had an accident early on, leaving Jacopini to grab the final podium spot in T1. Third on the Dakar at the start of the year, Martin Prokop held a podium spot in Abu Dhabi from the midway point. The Ford Raptor had been fast and reliable all week, giving the Czech and his co-driver Victor Chikta every opportunity to shine. Second overall, then they would climb from fifth to third in the W2RC standings. It was quite the week for Yazid al Raji. When the front runners stumbled, Yazid and co-driver Tino Gottschalk focused on the big prize, mingling speed with caution over the remaining two days to go one better than 2016 and claim overall victory. Really happy, first Saudi win in this uh, 32 years in Abu Dhabi, not easy rally, difficult, uh, a lot of dunes like you are in the sea of dunes. And uh, see you in Mexico. Plotting a safe course through the seas of dunes, the overdrive racing duo sailed to victory on the Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge atop an ever changing podium. A Toyota, a Raptor, and a T3 Can Am. Who could have picked that overall car podium? And somehow, despite his stage one disaster, Sebastian Loeb now sits 16 points clear in W2RC. But what will Mexico bring? To the victors, the spoils. Another breathless Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge is done. But the chase for the W2RC titles moves on to Mexico. We will see you there for more mayhem.